Hi, and thank you for joining us today on the Successes Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Portman. Joining me today is Rob Kessler, successful entrepreneur and inventor of Million Dollar Collar. Thank you for joining us today, Rob. Hey, Phil. How's it going? Great. So let's start with the opening question. What does success mean to you? Um, you know, success gives me the freedom to do what I want to do. Um, you know, I've worked for other people, including my father, and I know that you know, working for somebody else just isn't my thing. And I would rather struggle for 80 or 90 hours a week than work for somebody else for 40. So, um, you know, the success is, is the freedom to do what I want. You know, we, we just bought this house here in Georgia in March of last year. So about 10 months ago, and, you know, I work on my companies until two or three o'clock and I'm just itching to go outside and do something on the house and, you know, get my hands dirty and, bleed a little bit and you know that that to me is is happiness and success absolutely so can you tell us a little bit about your background how you how you got to where you are today yeah i mean i've really not followed any kind of uh, normal path i mean went to college uh i was going to drop out after about two years got inspired uh, caught up on all my classes, took winter on, took summer school, uh, graduated in four years. I was working full-time almost all four years of college. So 40 hour work weeks and still doing full-time college and graduated in four years. So um, I got my marketing degree, got that, uh, that piece of paper, first person in my family to graduate. So that's pretty cool. Oh, um, uh, while I was uh, my junior and senior year, I worked for my father in the jewelry industry. So you know, I'm 20 years old trying to sell engagement rings, five, eight, ten thousand dollars engagement rings to people. So it wasn't the easiest thing, but I was a decent salesperson. Um, left that, uh, moved, actually moved to help him open a store. Um, then I got into, into cars and moved to California for a year just to kind of take a break since obviously I didn't take spring break. I was working or taking classes. And so um, I kind of lumped all my college breaks into one year long uh, party in, in Los Angeles with my friends, uh, came home, got into real estate. Um, so I did residential real estate. I still have my license today. So it's been about 20 years since I did that. Um, ended up buying a duplex, bought a commercial building, bought another commercial building, sold all that, bought a yacht, started a charter business, running that right now, about to sell that, invented a product, had a screen printing business, embroidery business. Um, yeah, just did all kinds of stuff. Like I just, if I find something I like, I'd start diving in, I'd get super inspired and just, uh, you know, if there's an opportunity then to find a way to, to service the customer better, I do and grow a little business and either sell it or close it and move on. Yeah, so do you think those early days in your, in the jewelry shop were um, crucial to later on becoming the entrepreneur and that, learning the sales craft early on in your life? Uh, yeah, the sales helped in there. Um, actually, the, the job that really set me on my way, um, I worked at a little soccer and volleyball store in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, the guy day one ended up handing me a key to the store, a code to the alarm, put his full faith and trust in me. Awesome. Um, and he just said, whatever part of this business you want to be in, it, it's yours. And, you know, he had four or five of us. We all became like the best of friends. We worked our butts off. We were in college, you know, we'd party at night, but we, we really thought that that was our business. And he gave us the, the confidence to believe that we could really be, you know, at 17, 18 years old, you know, a business owner and, and have influence on what was happening. And that's what really gave me the confidence to go forward. So learning the different industries, cars and jewelry and, and houses, just, just learned how to craft that relationship. So going into e-commerce, which I'm in now, is just a whole nother world. I mean, it's it's a struggle because I can't build that personal relationship. You know, I, sure. I hear the cha-ching from Shopify, but I don't I don't know how it's gotten there. I don't know, you know, what I can do to make it better, but um, it's different. It's definitely different. Absolutely. So entrepreneurs in general are are just weird people, right? We we break the mold, and as you described, uh, you know, people often call us like. Uh, overly confident, arrogant. Um, and you come from a family of entrepreneurs, is that correct? Yep. Um, so did they encourage you to go the entrepreneur life or did they want you to go more of the traditional work at a job and that sort of thing? You know, I, my parents are very opposite. My dad's the entrepreneur, the businessman, you know, highly successful. My mom 
you know, they got divorced when I was pretty young. And so she didn't have that. You know, my dad kind of slowly grew that business after the divorce. She was working three jobs, but she still found time to spend. You know, I spent more time with my mom with three jobs and living with my dad than I spent with my dad because he was working so much. So, you know, I got the, you know, conservative, you know, take care of yourself and make sure you have something stable for my mom. And my dad was like, just, you know, go after it. And uh, I ended up going back to work for him. So I was in real estate in 2002 and three, I think is when I got in, you know, and I was 23 years old, again, 24, trying to sell houses to people, you know, the, my circle of influence just wasn't buying expensive houses. So I built a little business. I was doing four and a half, five million bucks a year at 26. And um, then 2008 happened. That all kind of crashed. I was on a, on a condo project that basically came to a screeching halt. And um, my dad ended up having one of his longtime employees retiring. And so, you know, it was, it was kind of time I needed something a little bit more stable. I had a duplex of my own. I had, you know, some monthly bills and things. And so I got back into that business with him. And then after about two years, uh, top salesperson in the store in the city, and I was ready for more. I mean, he always talked about, you know, you have my name, you're the son, you're going to take this over. And then it just never progressed. And so sure. it was like always beating my head into the wall. Like, dude, I need more of a challenge or I'm going to go yeah. insane. Retail just wasn't my thing. Just sitting around waiting for someone to come in. So we ended up, when we parted ways, we decided that family was more important than the business. And, and he was very supportive when I got into my screen printing business and really started to grow that. So that's great. He was that's supportive, great. but we never really had like the, you're going to be an entrepreneur or you're going to be a, that conversation never really happened is my parents just been really supportive all throughout. So it's been great. Either way you go. Right. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so Steve Jobs said life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made by people that were no smarter than you. Right. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own thing that other people can use. People look at companies, patents, right? Books, successful people and say, there's no way I can do that. What would you say to them? You know, I've had a bunch of ideas before and I never really uh, pursued them too much other than, you know, tinkering around a little bit, but um, I don't know. I, I didn't, I'm not a inventor. I wouldn't consider myself an inventor or some kind of like, you know, game changer. But as I got through this process, I just, I had a problem. You know, if you look here, this is my wedding photo and my shirt. That's before I even said I do. And the <laughs> photographer captured it perfectly. So I got a brand new shirt on. It's freshly pressed. It's steamed. It's 30 minutes old and it's, it's a crumbled sloppy mess. And so yeah. I came home from Jamaica from our wedding and I said, I have a problem. And I just started messing with it. And so it, it progressed. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, here's what it is. I cut open a shirt and I put a piece of cardboard down the front and I showed my new bride and she was like, Oh my God, I get what you've been like freaking out about all these years. Cause yeah. you know, I'm ironing the front of the shirt. I hate wearing ties and I'm trying to make it look good. And she's already ready to go out. And I'm like, still messing around with my shirt. And she's like, dude, what are you doing? So, you know, I just, it just kind of progressed. And, and now all of a sudden I got into this, like, Hey, I want to fix this problem. And maybe I'll sell a few units to, to people. And, I'm seven years in and, and it's, I don't want to sell a few units to a few people. I want to change dress shirts forever. There's no reason that my product shouldn't be in every single dress shirt. So, you know, somebody came up with the collar stay in the 1800s and somebody came up with non-iron in the fifties. And, you know, those things have changed dress shirts. And those have been the two major things that have happened in the last 150 years of, of dress shirts. So I plan on being the third. I didn't start out, you know, coming out saying I'm going to do this, but it just kind of grew to that point. Kind of developed because you found a need, right? And I think that's, one of the things I, I, I see people uh, suffer with is they have an idea, but sometimes there's not a need for it, you know, and they're trying to push this idea and it's like this uphill battle. And then on the other side, I, I see people that have had tremendous success and they say, look, I never intended to get into this business. And it could be a septic tank business, right? It could be trash, mm -hmm. whatever. But they said, you know what? I found this need for it. And I just went where the need was and, and, you know, created this successful business and this booming business from it. That sounds like what you did, right? So, uh, well, I think the difference between the, the person that's successful and not is listening to your customer. I mean, we were going to come out with our own dress shirt when it started and we did, we did a Kickstarter. We didn't get funded. 
Um, but unequivocally, the feedback was, why are you trying to compete with all the brands that are out there? Why not license the technology? And why can't I up the sh upgrade the shirts I already know and love? And so I changed from making a shirt and having, you know, $40,000 worth of inventory not get me very far and take up a, a room in my house to a universal aftermarket kit that can upgrade any shirt on earth. So I was willing to listen. And I think people that are successful are willing to listen to their, to their paying customers, not their friends. I mean, your friends got a lot of opinions, but when they're willing to put up the money and then have an opinion, I listen to that guy before your friend. That's awesome. That's good advice too. So being an entrepreneur, people always approach me with this great business idea that they have, right? Um, and then they're, they're hesitant of sharing that with fear of, you know, someone's going to steal it. You know, someone's going to steal their patent idea. Um, are their fears well-founded or would they gain more traction sharing their ideas with others? I mean, what's the risk versus reward with that? You know, I think you need to um, come out and protect yourself a little bit, but, you know, to... NDAs are easily broken. I mean, it, at some point you have to talk about it. Otherwise, what you, what you have is just an idea and you're a entrepreneur and not an entrepreneur. So, um, you know, a great name. I feel like my name is spectacular, million dollar collar. Could you know, try to find something that's better than that in the industry. So you can, you know, untuck it doesn't have anything proprietary, but they've got the best name for a shirt and they built a brand around the name, not really necessarily around the technology. So you know, the patent is great, but, you know, that becomes an entire war and it can be very expensive. My patent was in the six figures, so, you know, it's expensive to get. And there's been plenty of people that have done plenty of businesses without a patent. So um, it, it maybe gives you a little peace of mind, but at the end of the day, it, it's really not going to change a ton. I would just, you know, get some certain base things down. I mean, most entrepreneurs that you talk to, if you're looking for advice, have too much going on to try to steal what your idea is. I mean, you know, maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not, but you're better off getting the advice and, and taking that than holding everything tight to the chest. I couldn't agree with you more on that. I think that too many people have this fear and they want to hold everything close and then it limits their development. You know, and we saw that in the <laughs> software industry with open source software, right? Um, years ago you had like the microsoft's and the large companies that would sue the hell out of you for doing anything with their software and nowadays everyone's embracing open source software um they, they're it's more of an abundance mindset right um mm -hmm. and if you sh share your ideas with others and get others to contribute um as long as you have good people good brand good mindset your business is going to grow and flour uh, flourish as a result of it so I think that's a great, great idea. Yeah, agreed. Is entrepreneurship for everyone? No, absolutely not. I mean, um, you know, I've been fortunate in that I followed kind of my passions and not really chased the dollar. Like, I feel like when I chase the dollar, um, that's when I'm not successful. But, you know, my wife and I have grown a yacht charter business in Los Angeles, very competitive market to one of the top rated top book boats. We're three years in, we've got more business and we typically know what to do with. And wow, it's because we love boating and we just wanted to have, we couldn't afford to just buy a 50 foot yacht and let it sit there for most of the time. So we're like, well, let's, we sold our commercial real estate. We bought this boat. We started this business. I'm like, hey, man, if we can get a few, few charters a month, we can pay for the thing and then we can go out and have fun. And then a few charters turned to, you know, July of last year, we had 34 charters in one month. And um, I think we did about 170 or 180 charters last year. So it's oh, great. an amazing business. But it was because I was passionate about it, you know, and, and because you're passionate about something that's when you're going to be able to fight through those times where you're second guessing life and not sure what you're doing. If you're just chasing the dollar, you know, it, it's easy to give up, I think. So following up with that, I've, I've never had partners in business. Or I've never had success with partners in business and um, talking to you, it sounds like your wife has done some of it, but have you had partnerships in business in the past ones you've done? Yeah, so I have a partner, uh, a partner and a half, I guess, in my current two ventures, Million Dollar Collar and Go Tireless. So my partner, Steve, has been with me pretty much since the beginning. And then my dad is uh, an investor slash partner in both of those businesses. 
um, you know, he's retired, so he's, he's enjoying life and he, he busted his butt for a long time. So I don't, I don't put too much pressure on him, but, um, you know, my wife and I work really, really well together because she fills in the gaps where I'm weak and I'm, I fill in the gaps where she's weak. So, you know, I'm kind of the big picture. I think we can do this. What if we did this and, you know, go steamroll ahead and try to buy a boat and figure out a business. And then she sits down and says, okay, well, we need a contract and we need a waiver and we need to make sure we're protected and we need insurance and we need this and the website, and, you know, she handled all that kind of stuff. So, you know, between the two of us, then it's like, okay, we get on the boat. And what if we did this? What if we did that? And, you know, you know, our egos get in the way sometimes when we fight, but at the end of the day, you know, we're, this business has grown insanely fast because we both have uh, contributed a lot to what our strengths are and, and made it great. So I, I know that there's only so much I can do and, and having the partner, not your best friend that you guys are exactly the same and you think the same and you do everything the same. You need the person that's the exact opposite of you, not you're the same as you. If, if, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise you're just, you're going to get tunnel vision and you know, nobody challenging you. So. Absolutely. What, what are your thoughts on taking on debt, starting up a business? I try to avoid it. Um, my businesses, for the most part, I um, I try to funnel the money back through as much as possible in the early years. I um, mean, obviously, getting a patent and and starting this business, there was there was nothing. So you know, I was cutting checks left and right for this patent attorney. And um, but once the business started, and you know, I just try to keep as much money into it as possible and and recycle that. And you know, my dad likes to say you have to earn the right to grow. Um, so you know, keep that money in there. And then when you built up a little stash then you can go invest in something else to help grow the business. That's smart, smart method. So it sounds like your dad has been kind of a, a mentor to you uh, th over the years. Is, is, is Have you had any other mentors in your life or is that your primary mentor? Yeah, no, my, I've had tons of mentors. Uh, that first guy, Tim, that I worked for, um, you know, he was, uh, he was closer to me than my dad was for a while because my dad was so deep into growing his business. So um, you know, I've had him, uh, when I moved to Los Angeles within a couple months, I went in this business networking hike, totally random. Me and this guy, Russ started talking for the whole trip and, you know, for this like hour or two long hike. And then he's like, Hey, let's go to lunch. Let's go to lunch. He'd pick up the tab. And he's like, I really love what you're doing. I'm like, cool. But what do you do? Like, why, what, why are you buying everything all the time? He's like, oh, you know, me and my friends started a little travel site called Expedia. No uh, way. So he oh. became a very, very good friend and, and mentor. And um, I just know that if I can put myself in a room of smart people and be the dumbest guy in the room, that I'm going to learn something. And so that hike led me into this networking group. It wasn't really net, we're not like, you know, networking, like networking. It was a, it was a men's group. It was like a brotherhood in, in Los Angeles. And I just met like incredible people and surrounded myself with them the best I could. And, <clears throat> learn as much as I can always. What an awesome story. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That's I loved LA, man. You'd never know who you're going to meet. It was just, that's my wife and I, we spent five and a half years there and it was just like, you yeah. don't know. I, I've got six or eight Olympians in my phone and actors and, you know, I, the, my network grew out there unbelievably and it's musicians and Polly Shore was on our boat. We took, we went out to lunch with him after and he's like, Hey, do you want my number? And I'm like, sure, Polly, sure. I'll take your number. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? Yeah. So, yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, but I mean, it raises, you know, I think uh, humans are, are far more, you know, we have greater potential than we give ourselves credit for. And so it's, it's often difficult to see what your limits are, right? And um, until you get around other people and you say, oh my God, yeah, that is possible. Right. And I think that's a, a game changer, especially when you grow up with uh, potentially limited means and limited could be, uh, you know, a, a middle class family or upper middle class family or whatever. But eventually there's the, the limitations. And if you approach life with those same, same limitations, you have to kind of step outside um, your little bubble and see what is possible to grow beyond that. And um I think the it sounds like the yacht business for you has and, and in that industry has has been a great opportunity for you to meet people outside of your sphere. 
Oh yeah. I've met an un, unbelievable. Another, another one of my mentors, um, you know, his daughter found us, she wanted to take our boat for her 21st birthday. And he's like, okay, well, before I hand over my prized oldest daughter, you know, <laughs> that I love more than anything, let's take these guys up. And, and so he came out for a sunset cruise, like a couple of days before his daughter's birthday, just to like, check it out and make sure she was going to be safe. And he came, ended up coming out like eight or 10 times. He brought um, Ron White, the comedian and, oh, you know, cool. a bunch of people he brought out. And so it just was like, we, and we really hit it off. And so uh, the putting yourself out there and just getting around people, um, especially people that have done more things than you have to me is, is the best, you know, I, I get inspired by that. I come home, you know, I, I say to everybody about LA when we move there, it's either going to gobble you up because you're going to see all the success and all the excess and say that I'm never going to have that and, and have a pity party, or you're going to say, dude, that's amazing. I want that too. Want and that. find yeah. a way to kind of get in there. And so that's how we took it. We we're like, I want to be a part of that. So my wife ended up becoming a Hollywood stunt woman. She worked her butt off. So she's doubling crazy actresses. She does insane movies and tv shows and music videos and i mean she's just done all kinds of crazy stuff and how did she like, get into that the wildest I mean, thing yeah what's what's the story so, behind that? that's incredible so when we moved to la i knew i was gonna do million dollar collar we knew we had to get out of wisconsin because we were just you know stuck and bored and just not being challenged and so um, she had a little gym that she closed down and and we thought we were going to get she was going to get into like beach body corporate or something you know in that world uh, we we're just out hiking the dogs one day with uh, the only people we knew which were the leasing people in our apartment building and the guy's like oh you know one of my former you know residents was a stunt man do you want to meet him and she's like hell yeah let's meet him um so we met him and he told her all the horrible things about the industry you know you're constantly bruised and sore and long days <laughs> and she goes awesome that's awesome. it. That's right. <laughs> so she started training with those guys. And then Russ, the, the Expedia guy had us over. He's like, Hey, we're going to go watch Zoolander too. And I've got this couple that's coming and she's a stunt woman. And maybe Linda can talk to her. And turned out that that lady was Trinity's double in all the Mat original matrix movies. And no so way. she kind of became a mentor for Linda and said, Hey, go do this, this, and this. And Linda came back, called her like a week later and said, Hey, I did all those things you said. And she's like, what? Nobody ever does what I <laughs> So if you're going to have a mentor, just do what they say at least. Don't yeah. waste their time. So she did it. And then she's like, okay, well, now that you did these things, go talk to this person and that person. And, and each time it, the challenge was a little bit higher and she got to meet more impressive people. And Linda's resume is amazing for only being in the industry five years. She's worked more than most people that are eight, 10, 12 years in the industry. So. Wow. Hustle, baby. Hustle. I get it. And, and, and then it sounds like you guys are phenomenal at networking as well. I mean, just the people you're, you're rubbing shoulders with, are, it's, it's phenomenal. So, um, and yeah, then, I mean, every time we'd go out to LA once or twice a year, we'd, we'd come home and be like, God, we just met them. I don't know how it happens. Like we just out and bought like, we met Nick and Sophie Simmons one time and just like on these trips, we go out and we just meet these people. And it's like, <laughs> dude, we met more incredible people in a weekend in LA than like a year in Wisconsin. So like, let's go. And yeah. We just do. Yeah. It's great for business. I, I know a lot of people uh, join different groups that people golf, you know, obviously for networking and whatever they do right to get around that. And you guys have, as it sounds like figured out a, a very good way of doing it. So that's great. My wife's super hot too, so it makes it easy. That to helps, meet right? Meet, meet guys, yeah. <laughs> Guy, guys are always willing to talk to me because they're. How did you do that? What, what do you yeah. think? What's going on? Right. <laughs> so you guys are walking in public, and your wife has like bruises on her arms and stuff, and you, you guys get. Well, fun yeah, she'll, like, yeah, she'll come home though, and and you know she's taking a shower, and she's like, "Oh, there's a new one." You know, it's like in her upper thigh somewhere, and it was just you know she's jujitsu or one of the trainings that she's doing or something that she did on set and it's you know you're doing your thing and there's so much adrenaline you don't know that you got you know yeah, really yeah, hammered sure. somewhere sure uh, but she was training one time and took an elbow to the face and broke her nose and so i met her at the hospital and all the doctors and nurses were like <laughs> how did this happen i'm like I, dude i just i don't know here. yeah no, I, I appreciate you're doing your job but i did nothing i just got here I'm just being a supportive husband like a real yeah, supportive right. husband Right. Oh, She's a stunt God. woman. I'm in fashion. You know, we're, we, we right. have the opposite roles. 
That's right, right, right. That's crazy. They get everything back into place. I mean, did she have to go through? Oh yeah. Hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Still smoking hot. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Well, honestly, you uh, incredible person to talk to. I mean, I I uh, I'm just awed by the things that you and your wife have done, and um, the life that you have lived, and the success that you've seen. And um, you know, when we we talk about success in life. You know, part of that is enjoying life, you know, enjoying this life we live. And it sounds like you guys really are enjoying life and, and finding a way to, um, you know, provide value to others along the way. And that to me is, is really what success is all about. Um, closing it out, you know, how do people get a hold of you? How do they follow you? Uh, t- tell the people how they can get a hold of you. Yeah, we have um, Instagram, Facebook, and a website for Million Dollar Collar, which we didn't really talk about, but so Million Dollar Collar is like a collar stay, except it's nine inches long and it goes down the front of the shirt. So if you like to wear a dress shirt without a tie and you wanna look good and put together all day, Million Dollar Collar prevents the front of your shirt, that part's called the placket from collapsing and crumbling and looking terrible like it did on my wedding day. So milliondollarcollar.com, we're on Facebook and Instagram, Million Dollar Collar. Um, we also have a, a side company called Go Tyless which was the first shirt designed to be tieless with million dollar collar built in. And we took that company a step further. My factory can digitally print any logo on fabric. So if you've got employees that you want to have kind of a uniform shirt, but not, you know, left chest embroidered trade show looking shirt, yeah. we can take this contrast fabric, any color, any color logo and print your logos right onto that fabric and then put the shirts together inside of the cuff as well. Unbelievable shirts. Um, it's a 50 piece minimum. We can combine your orders. We could do a little bit less than 50 if we have to, but they're incredible. Made in Turkey. They're super high quality. Um, and so that one's called Go Tylus. And then if anybody wants to connect on LinkedIn, I'm at Rob Kessler, I, 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 I am the third. Well, thanks. Thank you very much, Rob, for joining us today. And everyone will see you next time. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for watching today. Be sure to like and subscribe for more future episodes of Success Is Podcast. If you have any suggestions, please comment below. Look forward to seeing you next time.